Uh, our next session um, looks at advancing human neuroscience, encoding, decoding, and neurofeedback using functional neuroimaging, and is going to cover the state of the art in this field. We have a couple of presentations uh, followed by a discussion. Um, yet again, we're going to try and squeeze in some questions of yours towards the end. Uh, the first presentation is Mapping, Modeling, and Decoding the Human Brain uh, by Jack Gallant, University of California at Berkeley. Professor Jack Gallant, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting meeting. I hope this uh, talk is amusing and somewhat interesting for you. Uh, I tend to think of the brain as a computer. Uh, it's not a computer like you would have on your desk, but it's a meaty, squishy computer that operates by principles that are still largely unknown. But the brain is an information processing device, and therefore uh, it represents information, and if we can build a device that can read that information, then we can build a brain decoder. Uh, it's been known for 150 years that there are dozens, probably hundreds, of anatomically distinct uh, brain areas that you can identify just in light microscopy. And uh, it's been discovered over the past 30 to 40 years by neuroanatomists that uh, these anatomical brain areas are very highly interconnected. Any given area of the brain has about a 50% chance of being connected to any other area of the brain. So the brain is a, a network, uh, hierarchically parallel uh, distributed network of tightly interconnected areas feeding forward and feeding back information all over the place. And we really have no concept for how uh, such a network should compute information. Now, for uh, one unusual property of the brain uh, that makes it very different from a von Neumann computer that you would have on your desk is that structure and function are very closely interlinked. After all, it takes about 20 minutes to grow a new synapse. So as you sit here listening to me and your thoughts are fleeting and changing inside your head, you're doing that with essentially one set of wires, which means that uh, thoughts must be some emergent property of the interaction of information flow across these different areas and through these networks over time. Uh, if we want to understand how this process operates in humans, uh, the best tool we have to do that with is uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, we can use MRI to study both structure and function. So on the left here, we have a diffusion image, which uh, purports to be an anatomical image of the pathways that we obtain using MRI. Uh, diffusion imaging is, uh, I would say, still kind of an aspirational technology at this point. Um, the data are uh, not contributing as much as I would say the priors are, uh, but it's still a work in progress. On the right, we have a functional MRI, which measures blood oxygen level dependent activity across the brain. This is a metabolic activity that's a consequent of neural activity. It's not a direct neural measure. Uh, this activity is measured in small volumetric pixels called voxels, and there are going to be about 50,000 voxels in your typical human cerebral cortex. Now, you can use functional MRI data to obtain what should be related to an anatomical parcellation of the brain. And the case where this has been done is in resting state MRI. Resting state MRI are signals acquired while people are placed in the magnet and uh, they're not performing an explicit task. Of course, people are always doing something. If you ask people to rest in the magnet, usually they're thinking to themselves, when the heck do I get out of this magnet? So there's something happening in the brain. You don't know what is happening. You don't have any X variables, only Y variables. So you analyze the covariances between the Y variables, and you can use a spatial clustering algorithms to recover uh, a parcellation uh, that is uh, not unrelated to the anatomical parcellation. Uh, it's my goal, and I think it should be the goal of all of functional neuroscience, to try to recover uh, functional parcellations of the brain, sort of a functional neuroanatomy, uh, but one that respects tasks, where we understand the stimuli and the tasks, so we can not only find out uh, what the areas are, but what information they represent. Uh, now, uh, functional representations are quite complicated. If we think of primary visual cortex, which is shown here on the left, you will all recall that there's a retinotopic map of the world in primary visual cortex. But if we zoom in to one little place in uh, visual cortex, we find out that there are many, many other dimensions represented at each retinotopic location. There are uh, ocular dominance columns, orientation columns, spatial frequency columns, all organized in this hypercolumn structure. So you can think of this as uh, something like a 10 or 15 dimensional space that's projected down under the two-dimensional cortical sheet. And the global organizing variable is retinotopy, and the local variables are all of the other things that are represented at each hypercolumn. 
Now, MRI is still fairly coarse, so we can only expect that we're going to be able to recover the global information in each brain area at this point. We're not going to be able to recover uh, the local spatial, the local uh, dimensions that are represented at each global position. So we're going to end up with a, recovering a, a low-dimensional subspace of what's really going on. So let's look at some uh, brain activity in MRI. It's always useful to look at your data uh, in the most unprocessed form you can first to try to get an idea of what's happening. The brain is inconveniently folded up inside the head due to evolution, so the first thing we do is we inflate it and we put some cuts in it and we flatten it out like uh, a large pizza. And then we uh, can paint the sulci and the gyri on the brain and we can paint the functional brain activity on the surface of cortex. So in this particular case, uh, blue means less blood flow and uh, red means more blood flow and blood oxygen. Now we're playing a movie while the subject is just lying in the magnet passively watching this movie. The movie has sound, and we can see the patterns of brain activity changing as the person watches this movie. And you can see that the patterns are dynamic. They're constantly shifting around depending on the content of the movie. And of course, anything that you can conceive of in this movie has to be represented somewhere in the brain. The edges, the motion, uh, the sounds, uh, the, the implications, fire, like a fire is really bad and I might feel sorry for the people that were in the fire. All of that information must be somewhere in the brain and we can decode some fraction of it by interrogating the brain activity measured in these 50,000 voxels and relating it to uh, the stimulus. And now my computer is refusing to advance. Lucas, can you please advance my computer? Or we can sit and watch this movie for five minutes. Well, it's a very entertaining movie. The universe. Ah, there it goes. All right. So uh, this is some data acquired um, from not a movie experiment, but a natural language experiment. People in this experiment were asked to uh, lie in the magnet. They were listening to autobiographical narrative stories. They're very engaging stories. Uh, and then we can extract different kinds of information from the stories, for example, the phonetic information, the semantic, and the syntactic. And we can uh, calculate predictions of each voxel and uh, draw the predictions on a flat map and show which feature spaces predict activity in each of the voxels across the brain. And what you can see is that there is some representation of phonetic and semantic, uh, syntactic information in the brain, but most of the brain, large swaths of association cortex, are representing uh, the semantic information in the stories, which is the meaning of the stories. So we can exclude the other two models and just look at semantics, and we can actually create a, a sort of a intrinsic semantic space for the brain that uh, illustrates how the brain represents different semantic concepts. And when you do this, you find out that the two most different kinds of concepts that are represented in the brain are social concepts, here shown in red. These are things like mother, father, uh, wedding, um, divorce, murder, these are families and good and bad things that happen to families for the most part. And uh, the other end of the continuum, the most, other most extreme kind of information that's represented in the brain is visual and tactile information like uh, coarse, soft, green, smooth, things like that. Uh, and we can paint the surface of cortex according to the semantic selectivity of each voxel. And now you see that these patterns of semantic selectivity are very, very rich and complicated, right? You can't recover fine, detailed semantic information unless you actually have good spatial information in the cortical map, because if you try to do that, say with EEG, uh, many, many semantic concepts from a local region will be smoothed together and your decoder will not work that well. To make a long story short, uh, we find that each semantic concept is represented at multiple locations in the cerebral cortex, and each cortical uh, location represents a family of related semantic concepts. Now, of course, this is only one brain. We can do this in individual subjects. So you might ask what happens with different subjects. So we can look at four brains here. These are the semantic maps for four different subjects who are all in the same experiment. And uh, you can see that these maps are similar. The anatomy, of course, is different in these four brains because uh, brains are as different as, say, your ears are between different individuals. Uh, but there are rough correspondences between the kinds of semantic information that is represented in these different brains. However, we would like something uh, more than just this uh, qualitative um, kind of map. We would like a quantitative map. And so to do that, we uh, invented a new generative algorithm that I, I'm very fond of called Pragmatic. And Pragmatic uh, 
essentially assumes that the brain is like a pizza and that functional areas are tiling the brain like the toppings on a pizza. Now, uh, everyone's pizza is a slightly different shape, so although everyone has the same toppings in roughly the same positions, the exact location of the functional areas and the exact shape of the functional areas varies across people. So uh, that's shown on the lower right. That's our sort of pizza model of the brain. And we can substitute the, uh, these functional areas with a ball and springs model, which allows us to do uh, gradient descent on a generative model and uh, actually probably MCMC. It's not a convex problem, but we can optimize uh, a model that will give us the probabilistic relationships between the functional assignment of individual cortical areas and individual brain anatomy. And what that does is it allows us to take a new subject for which we only have the anatomy and no functional data, and we can project onto the cortical surface where we think the functional areas will be. And that is shown on the left here. Uh, we recover something between 100 and 200 distinct functional areas that are all selective for different kinds of semantic information. And we get this in each individual subject from only one experiment. Uh, I should just mention that there's an online brain viewer that you can play with to look at these data. This is at my website, gantlab.org. Um, you can click on the brain viewer link, or you can just go to Hooth 2016. Um, this is a really fun thing to play with, but don't do it on your cell phone because it might start smoking and burst into flames. It will not work on your cell phone. You have to use a modern browser on a fast computer, but it's, it's very fun. I would recommend it. Okay, one interesting thing about these functional areas uh, that makes the process of functional assignment daunting is that they are plastic. They depend on the task. Um, we've known this from animal experiments, but it becomes very obvious in MRI. So on the upper left here is a map we get from people watching movies. This is a semantic map of about 2,000 semantic concepts. Uh, on the lower left is the map we get when people are searching for humans, and on the lower right, when people are searching for vehicles. And you can see that the semantic semantic representations change uh, dramatically when you change the task. And that is because uh, your brain, being a relatively plastic self-organizing system, organizes to optimize task performance dynamically depending on the task. So if you're if you've lost your cat and you go around your house looking for your cat, your brain becomes a giant cat detector and every piece of your brain tries to become the best cat detector it can. Now, a lot of parts of the brain are going to do a lousy job at that, but collectively, altogether, it improves your ability to detect cats. Now, once we have these encoding models, we can turn them into decoding models, and that's a straightforward process. Our encoding model goes from the stimulus through some feature space into the brain activity measurements. So we simply take the brain activity measurements, we pump them back through the feature space, and we recover the stimulus. And we have a lot of examples for that, because every uh, brain activity uh, encoding model that we construct uh, comes along with a, a, an associated decoding model. So here we're decoding edges from primary visual cortex. Visual cortex, of course, uh, is mostly an edge and orientation map. Uh, and you can see in the upper left is the stimulus we showed, and the upper right is the reconstructions. They look a bit cloudy, but if we just extract the edges and look at the edge correspondence, you can see that the edge correspondence is quite good. Uh, this is a different brain decoder that decodes semantic information from the high-level visual areas that represent uh, the objects and actions in movies. Uh, so you can see this uh, decoder also works fairly good. It gets talking, man, uh, hand. You'll notice dog will come up here in a second. You might wonder where is the dog, but if you wait a minute, uh, the dog shows up on the screen. It turns out we overcorrected for the hemodynamic delay when we made this movie. So this decoder works fairly well, and this should give you the impression, which would be correct, that if there is something in sort of working cognitive space, uh, we can build an encoding model it, for it, and we can decode it. For example, we can build a what language decoder. What a crazy decoder. world we're bringing our children into. He thought it sounded like the kind of statement that brings people closer together, pointing as it did to their common fate. But the sexy mom just glared at him and took the healthy living supplement, too, without asking. He put Lily in charge of the party while he was gone, and then he walked downstairs. And there must have been 5,000 people milling around, wrapped in furs or long overcoats or ski parkas, leather jackets. High school, college. So this decoder school, isn't perfect, but it's not bad. And uh, after we had our encoding models, this uh, decoder took us one day to create. So we didn't even optimize it. It was a very quick process. Uh, so. 
as I mentioned a second ago, if there is something sort of that exists in emergent working memory, the working cognitive space, uh, that's potentially decodable information. And there are only three factors that limit our ability to decode the brain. The first is the quality of brain activity measurements, and that's actually the main limitation. Because fMRI, as much as I love it and as wonderful as it is, it's a really bad measurement method. It, it measures a small, vanishingly small fraction of the information available in the brain at any one time. If you do a back-of-the-envelope calculation, it's probably recovering one one-millionth of the information that's available at any given point in time. That is not much. Uh, the second limitation is your accuracy of your brain models. But those, it turns out, are mainly limited by measurement, not theory. If we had better measurements, we could create better brain models, and those would allow us to build better brain decoders. And the third limitation is, of course, computer power, but that doesn't really matter because um, Moore's Law guarantees that computers will get faster and faster and faster. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.